Thanks for tuning in with us at Dream City Church Omaha. For further information, including past sermons, visit us online at dreamcityomaha.church. We hope you enjoy the message and that it has a positive impact on your life. I know, $8,000. George, I've got a little paper. I'll bet it's a warrant for my arrest. Isn't it wonderful? I'm going to jail. Merry Christmas. Reporters, where's Mary? Mary, oh, look at this wonderful old drafty house. Mary! 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 Have you seen my wife? How many of you just want to keep watching it? That, at, the end of the, at the end of the movie, God opens his eyes, and he sees that all of the things that he, think is, he, he thinks is dragging him down, all the things that, 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 that are an irritant to him, I mean, even, even the, eight, the missing $8,000 and the fact that he might go to jail, all of it doesn't matter because now he knows that life is a gift, amen? And so, so this morning as we, as we look at the scripture, I, I just want to propose to you again that, that God has a p- wonderful plan for your life. I, I was reminded as I was studying for this message of Genesis 25, verses 7 and 8, one of, the, one, one of my favorite scriptures in, in the Old Testament. The Bible says that Abraham lived to be 175 years old. Now, that's not my favorite scripture there, um, and that's not my goal is to live to be 175 years old. But here's what it says. Abraham lived to be 175 years old. Then he grew weak, and he died. And here's the, here, here it is right here. And he had lived a long time and satisfying life. Another version says, Abraham died satisfied with life. And I love that because my number one strength is futuristic. And I have no problem seeing 20 years down the road and 30 years down the road, even when I was, even when I was 20 years old, I saw myself as an old man sitting on a rocking chair and I, I propelled myself into the future. So, so here's the deal for me. I look at myself and I look at my life and one day I know that I'm going to be laying in that bed. One day I know that they're going to gather around me. One day I know that they're going to, that they're going to say nice things and they're going to sing songs and they're going to say, they're going to say, from ashes to ashes, dust to dust, we commit this man to the ground. From I, I know that's going to happen. I can, I can see it clearly in my mind. But here's the thing. When I get there, I don't want to get there having regrets. I don't want to take my dreams to the grave. I don't want to take my aspirations to the grave. I want to live life to the fullest right now. I want to, like Abraham, die satisfied with life. And and, and can I say to you this morning, that's where God wants you to be. God wants you to be at at the place when, when you're ready to step off that you look back and you're satisfied with life because that's what God wants for you. Jesus said, I came that they might have life that they might have it more abundantly. That word abundantly is an interesting word. It's from the Greek word periosis. And it means, it means this, it means above and beyond what is regular. Can I, can I say to you that Jesus came to give you life above and beyond what is regular? That word means extraordinary. It means even exceeding. Here's, here's, here's what, one, what one writer said. It means soup, not just abundance, but it means superabundance. Can I, can I say that that's God's will for you? God's will for you is to live this life of superabundance. There's one verse in, in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 16, where the Bible says, And of Jesus we have received fullness and grace for grace. Let me say that again. And from Jesus, we have received of his fullness, grace for grace. And as I studied it out a little bit, there were other versions that said grace upon grace. 
And, and, and what God wants to do is God wants to come into your life and God wants to give you grace, but he do, doesn't just want to give you grace. He wants to give you grace upon grace. He wants to give you strength upon strength. He wants to give you joy upon joy. He wants to give you love upon love. That's what that, it, it talks about the super abundant life that Jesus came to give us. And, and God is saying, hey, he came to give you exceeding abundantly above and beyond all that you can ask or think. That's the, that's the life that God wants for you. Can I tell you on, you know, when we got together on Thanksgiving, we had turkey upon turkey. I had mashed potatoes upon mashed potatoes. I had pumpkin pie upon pumpkin pie. Hello, come on somebody. When my, when my children came into my house, our refrigerator was full, our cupboards were full, our, our, our counters were full, and they could eat, they could go back, they could rest, they could come back, they could eat again, they could go back and take a break, and they could come back. Why? Because mama had prepared mashed potatoes upon mashed potatoes and potato salad upon potato salad, and she had prepared this upon that, and we could come back, and we could get as much as we want, and the Bible says... He has prepared a table, hallelujah, for me in the presence of mine enemies. And when I go to God's table, he doesn't just have grace. He has grace upon grace and love upon love and strength upon strength. Is there anybody in this house this morning understanding what I'm talking about? I'm talking about God coming to give you life and more abundantly. You see, that's God's will for your life. The, pro the problem is Jesus said this. He said the thief, some say the thief, comes to steal kill and destroy. He comes to steal, kill and destroy. And there are some of you that he's ripping you off and you don't even know it. See that word steal in the original language is the word klepto. Anybody ever heard of a klepto? Anybody ever been called a klepto? Don't lift up your hand. But we all, we've all heard that term, right? Kleptomaniac. What is that? That's a thief. That's a thief that can't stop stealing. The devil's a kleptomaniac. The devil's a thief and he can't stop stealing. And here's the deal with the klepto. A klepto will rip you off and you won't even know it. You ever see movies where they're teaching people how to be pickpockets? And they can, they, can, they can go by somebody and lift their wallet and they don't even know it. They don't even know they've been stolen from Oceans 8. <laughs> Oceans 9. Ocean 17. It's all about stealing from somebody they don't know that they've been stolen for, right? The sting. Yeah, any of you ever been stung? See, that's what the devil does. He comes in and he rips us off and we don't even know that we're ripped off. And not only does he come to steal, he comes to kill. Can I say to you that word kill isn't murder? He didn't come to murder you. That word kill in the original language is actually the word sacrifice. So when he comes, he comes to kill, he comes to thuo, to sacrifice. What, what, what was this telling us? It's telling us that if the thief hasn't already walked away with everything that you hold precious and dear, then he's gonna to try to convince you that you need to sacrifice everything because you don't deserve it anyway. Let me say that again. The devil not only wants to steal from you, rob you blind, but then he wants to talk you into sacrificing everything else because you don't deserve anything anyway. And he'll move you from stealing to killing, to sacrificing. And then ultimately he wants to destroy you. That word is the word apalumai, where we get our word apocalypse from. And so what is the thief doing? The thief is getting his hands into every good thing in your life. He's a pickpocket that has used an opportunity to rob you blind and you don't even know it. And then now he's talking you into sacrificing the rest. And he's creating these conditions and situations so horrible that you see no way to solve them except to sacrifice everything that remains from his previous attacks. And the goal of this thief is to lay waste to your life, to devastate your life. And nothing, if nothing stops him, he's gonna leave you insolvent, flat, broke, cleaned out of everything in your life. Make no mistake, the enemy is here to obliterate you, to obliterate your family, to obliterate your children, and to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, but, hallelujah, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly, hallelujah. 
Oh, come on, somebody. God wants a wonderful life for you. Turn to your neighbors, tell them God wants more for you. God wants more for you. Secondly, the second time I think that I see, remember I said that I've got, I've got one observation and then what else do I have? Come on now. Two ob- I mean, I got one proposal, two observations and a directive. Let's take a look at the first observation. Here's the first thing that I, that I observe. I observe that sometimes in life, we suffer not because of our own sin. Now, sometimes we do suffer because of our own sin. How many of you know we can be idiots? And so sometimes we suffer because of our own sin. But sometimes we don't suffer because of our own sin. Sometimes we suffer because of other sins. Sometimes we suffer because of our mama's sins, our daddy's sins. I've told you more on more than one occasion the story of me standing there as a five-year-old boy while people gathered around and said, We're not, you're not our brother. Mom found you in a garbage can. And that, that particular incident in my life was one of those incidents that imprinted something in me. And it, printed, and it imprinted something on my mind. It imprinted something on my heart. It imprinted something in my spirit. And the thing it imprinted in my spirit was, you don't belong. Somebody threw you away. You're not good enough. And I was suffering, didn't know that I was suffering, but I suffered because my mama and the bartender got together one night I was born and he decided that he was going to do his thing. and She was going to do her thing and mama gave me away. And, and, and here I was five years later suffering, not because of I, that I did anything, but I was suffering because of somebody else's mistake. Now understand, I didn't say I was suffering because I was a mistake. Hello. How many of you know the devil will tell you you're a mistake? And the devil told me I was a mistake until I was 18 years old. And then one day I read in Psalm 139 that I was fearfully and wonderfully made, that I was knit together in my mother's womb. Hallelujah. I realized I wasn't plan B or plan C or plan D. I was plan A. Hallelujah. God had a plan for my, my mama didn't have a plan for my, but God had a plan for my life. And so I, 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 I look at this and I think sometimes we suffer from other people's mistakes. Let's take, a look at, let's take a look at why George Bailey suffered. Let's take a look at Uncle Billy's mistake. 24. Eight thousand. Merry Christmas, Christmas. Well, good morning, Mr. Potter. What's the news? <laughs> Oh, well, 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 Harry Bailey wins Congressional Medal. That couldn't be one of the Bailey boys. You just can't keep those Baileys down. Now, can you, Mr. Potter? How does Slacker George feel about that? Very jealous, very jealous. He only lost three buttons off his vest. Of course, Slacker George would have gotten two of these medals if he had gone. Bad ear. Yes. <laughs> After all, Potter, some people like George had to stay at home. Not every heel was in Germany and Japan. <laughs> uh, good morning, Mr. Bailey. Good morning, Horace. Well, I guess you forgot something. Huh? You forgot something. What? Well, aren't you going to make a deposit? Oh, sure, sure I am. <laughs> well, then it's usually customary to bring the money with you. Huh? Oh, shucks. <laughs> I... I, I, I yeah, how about that finger there? Huh? Anyway. Bailey. Take me back there. Hurry up. Come on, look sharp. It's amazing how he, he leaves the bank, he goes back to the savings and loan, and the bank examiner's there. And 
They need to come up with $8,000 and, and, and it just sends George into this tailspin. And, and there's this one scene in which he grabs Uncle Bill and he says, he says, where's that $8,000, you stupid old man? And, and he says, someone's going to jail here and it won't be me. He goes out and he gets drunk and, he, well, you'll see it in a bit. He winds up on a, on, a, on, on a bridge and he's contemplating suicide. He's got his life his, his, his life insurance policy in his pocket and, and, and somebody has told him during the course of the night, dude, you're worth more dead than you are alive. Devil ever told you that? Devil, de devil ever tempted you in something and said you're worth more dead than alive? Have you, ever, have you ever contemplated things you thought you would never contemplate? You see, we, he finds himself in that situation because, some, because not, not because he did anything, but, but because Uncle Billy lost the money, and now it's falling on him. And, and see, listen, sometimes you will suffer not because of your own mistakes, not because of your own weakness. Sometimes we suffer because of other people's mistakes. Uh, it reminds me of a guy by the name of Mephibosheth. Anybody ever remember Mephibosheth? Say that three times real quick. But Mephibosheth was a, he was the grandson of a guy by the name of Saul. Now Saul was the, was the first king of Israel. Saul had a son by the name of Jonathan who had a son by the name of Mephibosheth. Now, when Mephibosheth was young, he was about five years old, there was a nanny that was taking care of him. It just so happened that his daddy and his granddaddy were out and they were, they were making war against, I believe it was the Philistines. But as they were making war against the Philistines and the Amalekites, things went bad. They found themselves surrounded, they got killed, and when the news got back, because obviously you understand that, that when a king died, that it, it was necessary, so they thought, for the conquering army to come and kill his entire lineage. Because if his line continued to live, then one day, Others would rise up to succeed the king and they would challenge their authority. So, so, so when, the, when the nursemaid, when the, when the nanny heard that Jonathan had been killed and Saul had been killed, she panicked. She grabbed this five-year-old boy and she began to run for, for the hills. And as she headed for the hills, she was running down the steps and she tripped and as she tripped, she must have landed on the boy. And as she landed on the boy, he got hurt. In fact, he got so severely hurt that he would never walk. And he would go throughout the rest of his life lame and handicapped because not of his own mistake, but because of somebody else's mistake. You see, this woman in her panic, this woman in her weakness dropped this young man, and it hurt him severely. And in fact, it hurt him for the rest of his life. He would never get over those particular injuries. And listen, there are people that have dropped you. There are people who in their weakness have made mistakes. There are people that have hurt us and some of us will never be the same and our lives will never be the same. You see, the Bible says that as Jesus passed by in John chapter nine, he saw a man which was blind from his birth and his disciples asked him saying, master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind? You see, sometimes we suffer and they understood that concept in the New Testament. They said, they said, they said why is this guy suffering? Did he suffer because of his own, his own mistakes or did he suffer because of his parents' mistakes? And, and so I propose to you, the first, uh, uh, or the first observation is that in, in life we suffer sometimes because of someone else's mistakes. And the second observation is this, things aren't going to change until we get God involved. And so if you find yourself hurting, if you find yourself being dropped, if you find yourself because of somebody else's weakness in a situation, I look at this and I think to myself, well, things aren't gonna change until we get God involved. And that's where the story actually starts. Because in the beginning of the story, it opens up with people praying. 
I love it. Take a look at it. I owe everything to George Bailey. Help him, dear father. Joseph, Jesus, and Mary, help my friend, Mr. Bailey. Help my son, George, tonight. He never thinks about himself, God. That's why he's in trouble. George is a good guy. Give him a break, God. I love him, dear Lord. Watch over him tonight. Please, God. Something's the matter with Daddy. Please. How many of you know that's where it starts? That's where restoration begins. When we call upon the name of the Lord, it reminds me of Jeremiah 33, 3 that says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. You see, it's through prayer that we engage God. How many of you understand? You need to get God involved in your situation. And when you get God involved in, in your situation, stuff happens. It was when Mary and Martha went to Jesus and, and, and got him engaged in their situation that Lazarus rose from the dead. It's when the little lady with the issue of blood pressed through the crowd and touched his, the hem of his garment, she engaged the power of God and she was healed. It's when Bartimaeus cried out, Lord, have mercy on me. What was he doing? He was engaging God. See, we need to engage God, right? How many of you drove to church this morning? Can I say you engaged your engine? You, 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 you put your, your, your key inside that, that, that ignition and you turned it and what happened? There was some fire that, that took place in your engine and then what did you do? You, you didn't just sit there in your driveway and go, vroom, vroom, vroom. You should be sitting in your driveway. What do you do? You take, you, you take your, your lever and you pull it down to reverse, right? Then you put your, your foot on the gas a little bit. And what does it do? That lever engages the transmission. The transmission is called a transmission because it transmits the power from the engine back to your drivetrain. And so what happens? It engages the power. It transmits the power back to your wheels and your wheels start turning. See, that's what prayer is. Prayer is the transmission of God. Prayer takes the, 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 the power that is in heaven and it transfers it to here on earth. And what we need to do is we need to take that, tra that, that, that lever and we need to pull it and we need to call upon the name of the Lord. We, God says, call upon me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. We need to engage the power of God. We need to take our faith and, 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 and ignite uh, the, the, the power of God and engage it through prayer. There's a, there's a woman by the name of Rizpah. You ever heard of Rizpah? Rispa, she's not, she, she's not on MTV, and, uh, and, and, and she, she's, she's not on the top. But there's a woman in the Old Testament by the name of Rizpah. Her, she, she's found in 1 Samuel chapter 20 or chapter 22, 21, right in between 20 and 22. 1 Samuel 21, what happens? Well, short, let, let me shorten up the story because I only got a couple of minutes left. Is, is this okay today? I know, I, I know I'm taking a long time to kind of unfold this, but, uh, but hey, hey, you don't have any place else to go, right? <laughs> and so, so, so this morning, hey, just give me a couple more minutes. And so, and so what happens? Well, Rizpah, Rizpah, her two sons have died. Now they are Gibeonite, or, or they're, they're, they're descendants of Saul. Back in the day, Saul made a decision. He made a decision to, to, to kill the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites had made covenant with Israel. As they made covenant with Israel, Israel said, we will not destroy you. But Saul, when he came, he destroyed them anyway. Now it's years later, there's judgment from God because Saul broke covenant with the Gibeonites. God, uh, Saul broke a treaty with the Gibeonites. So I know how that feels. Come on, Indians. We won't go there. <laughs> so there was, this, there was this broken treaty, right? And, uh, and, and, and God, how many of you understand? God takes treaties between people serious. 
And so now God's judgment is up on the land. And so they go to the Gibeonites and, and they say, what, what, what can we do to make amends? What can we do to reconcile and to redeem the situation? They said, give us seven sons of Saul and slay them. Now this woman, Rizpah, was one of Saul's wives. She had two sons and they slew her sons and they hung them. And the birds came and the birds were picking at their flesh. And so what this woman did is she came and she camped out. And I don't know how she did it. I'm assuming she probably took a stick or she probably took her, 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 her uh, a cloth and she fought off the birds. And when the birds would come back, she'd fight off the birds again. And she did this for days and days. Her sons hung there dead and, 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 and she was fighting off the birds. You think, man, that's a crazy woman. Her sons are dead. There's a... But here she was. She was fighting for what was left. And listen, there are things that have died in your life. There are situations that you're looking at and you're going, there's no way. I'm suffering for somebody else's sin and I don't know how I'm gonna rebound from this. And what God is saying to you through this is, look, your marriage might look like it's dead. Your relationship with your mama might look like it's dead. Your faith might look like it's dead. There are things in your life that might be dead. And right now, uh, th there's not a whole lot of hope. But God says, even though there's not a whole lot of hope, you can still get out and you can still take your faith and you can still fight for what's left. Hallelujah. Fight for what's left of your faith. Fight for what's left of your marriage. Fight for what's left in your life. Fight for it. Some say fight for it. Turn your neighbors up. You got to fight for it. And the last thing we see in this is not only do you, do you fight for it, you need to understand God can turn anything around if you just, call, if you just cooperate with him. God can turn it all around. You see, here's, here's a thought I want to give you, and I want to leave this thought with you this morning. A permanent solution is never the answer to a temporary problem. Let me say it again. A permanent solution is never the answer to a temporary problem. What was George doing? George was on that bridge and he was going to jump in and he was going to end his life and he was going to, and he was going to offer a permanent solution to what he would find out would be a temporary problem. And a per permanent solution is never the answer to a temporary problem. You see, what we need to do is we need to, we need to find a place of repentance. That's what George did. He found a place of repentance. That's why the Bible says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Let's take a look at that last clip, and we'll be done today. Clarence! Clarence! Help me, Clarence! Get me back! Get me back! I don't care what happens to me. Get me back to my wife and kids. Help me, Clarence, please. Please, I want to live again. I want to live again. I want to live again. Please, God, let me live again. Hey, George! George! You all right? Hey, what's the matter? Now get out of here, Bert, or I'll hit you again. Get out of here. What the Sam Hill are you yelling for, George? You... George. Bert, do you know me? Know you? <laughs> you kidding? I've been looking all over town trying to find you. I saw your car piled into that tree down there, and I thought maybe you... Hey, your mouth's bleeding. Are you sure you're all right? What you... <laughs> My mouth's bleeding, Bert! My mouth's bleeding! Zoot, zoot, pedals. Zoot, zoot. There they are! What do you know about that? What happened? As he repented, as he, as, as he found himself at that place of calling upon God and engaging God through faith and engaging God through prayer, God came and God answered him. And that's called repentance. That's called cooperation with God, right? And what God wants is God wants us to cooperate, to resist the devil, to submit ourselves to him. And God says he'll hear, he'll answer. He'll save. I, I want to close with a story. 
Some of you have heard the name Marcus Luttrell. Some of you haven't. But Marcus Luttrell is a Navy SEAL or is a former Navy SEAL. Marcus Luttrell is a young man who wrote a book called Lone Survivor. He wrote this book called Lone Survivor and he described this situation in which he and four other SEALs were commissioned to go to a small community in Afghanistan. And they were to take out one of Osama bin Laden's top men. And while they were camped and while they were waiting to, to do that, they were spotted by three shepherds. There was an argument and they, 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 they said, we need, to, we, need to, we need to take care of this. They're gonna go and they're gonna let them know that we're here. Well, two of these three were just kids. And so they decided against it. Well, it wasn't much longer until they had 200 Taliban around them. And they, they had 200 Taliban around them. They found themselves falling headlong down a mountain. Well, as a Navy SEAL, you understand that, well, maybe you don't. But when Navy SEALs do their training, there's this thing called Hell Week. And as, as they go to be trained, they spend nine days or 10 days training in this grueling condition, having four hours of sleep a night, being drowned, being wet, being hungry, and it all brings them to that place, to that breaking place. And the commander goes to them and says, whenever you guys are done, whenever you, you've had enough, there's a bell outside the, the mess hall. All you have to do is ring it. And every day, he said, you hear bell, the bell ringing. Nobody's gonna ask any questions. Nobody's gonna try to talk you into staying. All you have to do is ring the bell, go back to your barracks. You'll be put on a bus and you'll be taken you'll be taken back to the base. Can I say that they train them that way for the times in which they're falling down the mountain? For the time in which you've got to go beyond your own strength and you've got to get in your head that no matter what, I'm not going to quit. See, the devil's trying to get some of you to ring the bell. I get some of you to give up. Give up on that marriage. Give up on that relationship. Give up on God. And my encouragement to you this morning is don't ring the bell. Come to God and say, God, no matter what, I'm going to cooperate with you and I'm going to be here when everybody else has walked out. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, God, this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for, we thank you for things that we, that we can look at in life and go, that's true. Because Lord, every truth is your truth. And so Father God, we pray that as we, this morning, contemplate truth, if it's true, that you want us to live a wonderful life. If it's true that we suffer because of other people's mistakes and not just because of our own, if it's true, Lord God, that we can take faith and through prayer engage the power of God, then God, this morning, we wanna take our faith and engage your power. And Father, if it's true that if we'll repent, you'll change things, God, we ask you to get involved. We repent this morning. We ask you change our lives, change our city. Father God, don't change our situation, change us. And Father God, we realize if you change us, we can change our situation. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and nobody's looking around, can I ask you this morning, do you need to repent? Do you need to turn your life over to God? If so, I wanna pray with you right now. And if that's you, just lift up your hand, pray for me, pastor. I find myself in that situation. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Others, God bless you, God bless you. This morning, I wanna return to God. I wanna engage God. I believe God wants more for my life. If that's you, just slip up, slip up your hand, put it back down. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's pray right now. Pray with me today, would you? 
We're going to commit ourselves to God. Let's pray it out loud. Jesus, come to you right now. And I thank you that you are for me, not against me. That you want more for my life. And yet, the enemy has come. And he has stolen. And Lord, he is trying to talk me into sacrificing. And Lord, he wants to destroy everything about me. And yet you came that I might have life. So I ask you to forgive me. Come into my life. Change me. Come into my heart. Make me who you dreamed I could be when you created me. God, I give you my past, my present, my future. I give you my life. Have your way, oh God. I pray in Jesus' name. Pray for my family. God, have your way. Help us this Christmas to get back on track. I pray in Jesus' name. Now, Father God, I pray for everyone that lifted their hands and even those that didn't. God, this morning, we need to get back on track. And Father God, we want to engage your power. And Father God, we want to cooperate. We want to repent, Father God. If we've been going the wrong way, turn us around, Lord. Let's, let's, let's get to that point where we can cry out with George, I want to live. God, give us life, change us, pour out your spirit upon us. And Lord, I pray for those that haven't watched that movie, they would go home and watch that movie. But more than watching the movie, may we get into your word. And Father God, may we know what your word says. Father God, in Jesus' name, we love you and we thank you. And everybody said amen. 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 Stand with me this morning. Hallelujah. I took a long time. Hopefully you got something out of it this morning. Pastor John will be back next week. So for those of you that uh, miss him, uh, he'll be back. So God bless you. Greet one another. Be dismissed in Jesus' name.